it's great especially for when you're running when you're running a uh, a live broadcast um it's great to it's great for that's one thing i found since doing the live show um is the interaction's great the listener interaction's great um the a lot of the feedback's good um i that's why i like dedicating a segment or two just to the listeners just to uh getting back to comments because for a long time when i was uh doing um just the stuff on youtube um i got i would get a lot of comments and i would try to respond to as many as i could um but some you know they would just get buried and you just kind of forget about it once the next video goes out and the next video is go, goes out next thing you know there's like seven videos since you have went back to that comment you've been meaning to get to um but for the live show, I, I just like taking the time to actually go through it, pick the best ones, and and just uh, share it with you guys. Just because I think there's a lot of stuff. There's some, I mean, just the past three weeks alone, think about all the stuff that's happened. Um, so, And I'm not just talking about political stuff and like this coronavirus thing and, and the economy and stuff. I'm just talking about, I mean, that stuff goes as well. I mean, so many things can happen at any given time. But I'm just talking about in just archaeology and, and science. There's always something coming out, and it's really it's really hard to keep up um, because as soon as it's like whack-a-mole, right? You hit one, and then two others pop up. It's it's really hard to um, ignore some of the more pressing stuff that comes out, and it sucks to have to put stuff in the back burner. There's a lot of stuff in the back burner um, that I, I want to get to, but just like the Younger Dryas stuff, the Abu Herrera stuff, which I think I talked at length last time. If you're just tuning in, Abu Herrera is the first city to be, or the first human settlement to have been conclusively destroyed by the Younger Dryas directly from an impact. They got completely leveled. And uh, for the longest time before that evidence came out, scientists were just didn't know why there were, it seemed the city had two different phases, like distinct phases. Um, there was, you know, the hunter gatherer phase, the more, uh, uh, there's one, basically one, uh, completely different way of living. And then there's this agricultural phase after a certain period of, of, you know, turmoil that they just assumed was turmoil. But then now they know, oh, there's melt glass here. There's all these impact proxies. Oh yeah. This place was leveled, um, around 13,000 years ago and it completely wiped out the population until it got resettled again. Um, so yeah. And how many more of those cities are there, you know? So again, a lot of the, this, um, just the interesting thing, just by default, just by following, um, the reading and just what's not just the reading, but the, the updates that are, if you're, if you're reading, keeping up with the scientific articles and, and interviews and, and discoveries, you can just see like, just, you don't, you don't need a degree to notice this. You just need to be paying attention. And that is some of these uh, archaeological findings and geological and, and biological, genetic, all that stuff. All of these new sites that are being discovered and all these conclusions that are being reached really do fall in line with, with stuff I mentioned, which has been a running theme for like the past eight months now uh, since I've been doing the content in this channel. Um, is... Well, longer than eight months, probably closer to a year and a half. But the running theme is like a lot of these scientific discoveries are corroborating with cultural stories, ancestral stories, stories passed down, oral traditions, um, biblical stories, all of these things. Uh, hi uh, ancient historical accounts like Herodotus and Xenophon and all these guys. Um, so uh, Carvajal, all these people, it, again, it's uh it's very interesting to see this unfold and it really does provide uh especially just the the most i get well more a lot more people are reading now for sure there's got to be a spike now because of all this either self quarantine or or imposed quarantine from the government um more and more people are reading and it just the most basic average reader who who just follow who is interested in this stuff they can see like, wow, they're actually, it'll change their frame, the framework at which they not only view the subject matter, but also how they interpret it. So um, if you, if you find out that a, a city was leveled 13,000 years ago, and you also know about the biblical flood story, you know, about stories like Atlantis and stuff, it, it 
ch- it changes the impact that story has on you and it el- often elevates it from myth to right a, a kind of um informed imp- more informed opinion and and it, and it resonates differently with you once you find out that wow this these aren't just fairy tales you know there there must be there must be some sort of nugget of truth coming by yeah there might be embellishments and stuff like that there are always embellishments so that is actually one of the hugest and most uh, justified critiques of the ancients is they might have embellished things just like um, for example, armies, right? That's the most common one. They embellish the, num- the numbers to make it seem greater than it was. But it doesn't take away the fact that a battle was fought, right? Um, same thing with um, with uh, Plato, Plato, uh, Plato's story of Atlantis, and which he purports he got from Solon, which was his ancestor it, who lived around, I think, 600 BC. He got the story from Egyptian priests. And if you look into other uh, peripher- per- peripherally related stories around Egypt or, of that time, they all have these stories again where Egypt was goes back to Zeptepi, the first time, right? The, a different era, essentially. They are the legacy of a different era. They, you, if you guys have followed John Anthony West or Robert Bavall, uh, espe- especially uh, John Anthony West's work, you you would know that Egypt really when disco- when ancient Egypt was was discovered it's fully formed and functioning it's not an up and coming civilization um, so what that means is they were on the tail end of 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 gl- of a glory of a glory a glory period you, you could say um, they are the they were the one of the last remnants of a greater empire, whatever it was, not a, a greater civilization. Who knows? Maybe it wasn't even an empire. Maybe it was just, you know, just some some culture with a mutual understanding uh, of that war was terrible, and maybe they just developed in a different way, uh, much like the Atlantis story, right? Anyway, I'm rambling my my ass off right now. I'm glad that it's the Vernal e- Equinox, guys. Happy Vernal Equinox. Um, if you guys were to have woke, if you guys woke up at 6 a.m., 5 or 6 a.m., depending on where you live, um, and depending on whether you acknowledge daylight saving time, if you looked due east, uh, when the sun is rising, when, when was the sunrise in California? Let's just look that up right now. The sunrise was... Okay, that was a waste of time. It, Google won't tell me when the sunrise was this morning. Um, anyway, I, I'm guessing it was right around like probably five, five fifty or something like that, five fifty-two, something like that. I'm just gonna guess. Um, if you were to look due east, you would see the sun rise in the constellation. Um, so it would, I, it wouldn't exactly be Aquarius. It would be like right in between uh, Pisces and Aquarius, I think. Um, but um, anyway, that's the Vernal Equinox. If you guys were at the, um, if you guys were at the Sphinx nine thousand years ago, then you would see the sun rise in the constellation of Leo. I think it's nine thousand years ago, around there. Um, Ninth, no, sorry, 9,000 BC, 9,000 BC, not 9,000 years ago. I think 9,000 years ago was to- the age of Taurus or something like that. Um, anyway, I'm rambling my ass off, guys. Please send me any the long and short of it. Please send me your comments. We will get into uh, the Mantis Man and all the cool petroglyphs. And then probably at the bottom of the hour... We'll, I'll get into some of Bruce Fenton's work and, and just see uh, how long that goes. And then uh, toward the end of the second hour, I will get to your comments. Um, so please uh, get in and listen up and you know keep reading. If, you're, if you guys are in quarantine, you might as well be, be uh, getting, you know, making the most of your time. Uh, if you have an iPad, there are great reader apps. Um, download PDFs. Go to PDF Drive. PDF Drive is great. You can get you can download old books from like the 1800s and 1900s. Um, get some reading done. 
If you guys are just wanting to start out reading, do 10, 15 minutes of reading a day. Try to get one or two articles in. Highlight it up. Actively read. If you have any questions, hi, uh, write the questions in a margin or on a napkin somewhere, and then, and then go answer those questions. Find the answers to those questions as best you can. Open yourself up to more reading. Um, now is the best time, especially if you are out of work. Uh, which, by the way, my my job has cut my hours like crazy. Um, so I've been doing a lot of reading as well. A little too much reading. And also I, a lot of sleeping too because I, I felt actually felt kind of ill for the past four days. So, um, I, yeah, I, so I, I've done a lot of reading but not a lot of uh, working on, on um, some of the stuff here. But I do have a lot, of talk, a lot to talk about. I do want to get into this uh, Bruce Fenton stuff. So yeah, go um, do some reading. I will be back. I'm going to take a short break. And then we're going to get into some of these petroglyphs. The ancient, ma ma the ancient mantis man in Iran. Uh, the 143 new geoglyphs, uh, which I think I'm still kind of uh, skeptical on. But you guys, please uh, look it up and uh, for the next, for, uh, for the next uh, segment. And um, see if you agree with me or not. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. We are back. We are going to talk about some of the rock art they found in Iran. And if you guys just, since this is radio again, um, just Google Timara, T-E-Y-M-A-R-E-H rock art site, and just go to images and you'll see all these different um, rock art uh, that they found at the site in Iran. Really interesting stuff. Um, and among them, they found this squatter mantis man, which they believe is some sort of, uh, uh, I guess you would say, anthropomorphic um, uh, image of people. And again, I did a video about the, like the, the, uh, some of the statues that they found, like the, li the lion man, um, and some of the other stuff. Again, having this similar... Uh, motif of half man half fill in the blank whatever it is um if this was martin sweatman he would probably analyze uh, the symbols and he would test his symbolism hypothesis and uh and he would cross-examine that with the, the how the skies looked and the constellation that would uh represent but i don't know what he would say about a mantis so um if you guys or if martin Sweatman, if you're listening um which i highly doubt you're listening but if you are what does that mean? Is a mantis? Because uh, I know a boar is is similar is the sa same symbol as a bear according to your work, um, or according to uh, Sweatman's work. I wonder what a mantis would be. Maybe a dragon or something. Uh, but anyway, this is really interesting stuff, um, and it's about it's, it's like a couple feet. I think it's a couple feet uh, long. I think, but yeah, it's it's a really interesting. Um, really interesting stuff so uh anyway so they find this uh place at a known rock site tamara rock art site in Komain county in central iran okay six limbs has been described as part man part mantis um so one of the one of the things that the surveyors noticed that the, the archaeologist noticed was that rock carvings of invertebrate animals are rare Okay, so this is a pretty rare motif as it was. Um, so they compared this carving with others around the world and with the local six-legged creatures uh, which its pre prehistoric artists could have encountered. So uh, these, uh, this team, I think it was like an entomologist, um, an archaeologist from uh, National Taiwan University. Um, they published this stuff in the Journal of Orthopetra Research. Uh, so it's 14 centimeters. So yeah, it's a 14 centimeter uh, carving. So this is pretty recent. This is 2017 that they found it, and they spent the past two and a half or so years just studying it. Um, they weren't sure what it was at uh, first, but they did know that the triangular head and big eyes must have su uh, suggested an insect. Um, the forearms are, of course, that of a praying mantis. There are very few animals in uh, in nature that have those types of uh, grasping bladed forearms. So, um, 
it's very interesting that they that uh, the middle limbs, which end in loops or circles, kind of parallel some sort of uh, man that might be squatting, right? So it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, I think it, it's gr I think it's great that they keep finding this stuff, and I think um, I think a year before this in India, I did an episode on this. They found a petroglyph at the top of a mountain. I can't remember the name of it, but that was dated. <laughs> Man, I think it was like 7,000 plus years ago that that thing was dated. So I, petroglyphs themselves, especially the stuff like the Nazca lines, where you can only see it if you, you have an aerial, aerial view, that stuff really confuses the hell out of me. It makes me wonder either, one, that ancient people were capable of getting a satellite image of something in real time, kind of like how we can now, or they had like some sort of drone technology or something, something like that. Or B, the Nazca lines are probably a hoax, like kind of like crop circles. But I don't know. I really don't know um, what to think either way. I don't, I don't, at least the original Nazca lines, I definitely don't think are a hoax. But some of these new ones are just, man, they're, they're, it's just too, too coincidental. Um, it, it, I don't know. It, by the way, guys, if you're looking for something to comment, comment on the Nazca lines right now. I think um, I I'm, I'm, I don't like to fence it on a lot of things, but I just need more information. I think that's something I want to uh, – because the way the Nazca lines were formed, they were just removing the, the black topsoil and revealing the, the lighter soil on the bottom. And they just created this huge images, which you, you could see from like a helicopter and stuff like that. Um, but if you're on the ground, it, it wouldn't have much of an effect. You, you would have to get pretty close just to – uh, just to see that there is some sort of, you know, right angle, straight lines going on, but you wouldn't really be able to make out the image unless you were directly on top of it. So anyway, and then this one in India is just, <laughs> it's just super, I, for the life of me, I don't remember the name. It was, it was a while ago since I did that episode, but if you guys are listening, you guys should totally check it out. Um, just type in like petroglyph. Uh, India starts with an R. I forget, man. <clears throat> sorry, I need more coffee, but um, I just don't remember the name. That was one of the most interesting uh, uh, articles that I've uh, read relating to uh, petroglyphs and 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 stuff like the Nazca lines. So um, back to Iran, uh, these experts they think the Tam Tamara site and the estimated carvings uh, made within the site are <laughs> they have this huge gap between 40,000 and 4,000 years ago. So I think um, the thing is, I think this is probably a site that was, it would come, like people would come and write, uh, mark some stuff down and then leave and then intermittently come back. So there are a lot more younger petroglyphs compared to the oldest one, which they think is 40,000 years ago. But either way, 40,000 years ago, that's that's around the time that, that Neanderthals supposedly went extinct. So um, that, that must have been a really interesting time period that we know very, very little about now. Um, so perhaps uh, the petroglyphs that were created back then played some sort of role uh, in, in uh, that change, I guess, that genetic uh, and uh, demographic change in the area. Um, so one thing's for sure, though, the fact that they had praying man mantis like engraved in in stone that's old that predates the younger dryas in a site that predates the younger dryas that praying mantises were always or man mantids rather were animals of mysticism and appreciation meaning that they were revered they people took note of wh how unique they were how efficient they were as hunters how um because again like i mentioned there aren't that many and maybe back then there were more animals with with scythe forearms but uh it, as of now it seems they're pretty unique and wonderful animal um there are videos of them jacking hummingbirds it's insane um look that up look up praying mantis hummingbird or praying mantis mouse and they're just they're lethal and they're they they weigh nothing it, it's it's just insane so let's let's look at um the 143 more uh, ancient drawings in Peru, um, the the Nazca lines rather. Um, they discover 143 new geoglyphs which depict people, animals, and other strange beings. 
Uh, some look like a reptilian humanoid. So we have this humanoid thing again. We have this tarantula guy. Um, and it's around, again near in southern Peru near the near the Nazca line. So how, how long and how big are the Nazca line? Uh, were at, at its peak at its heyday. I wonder how big this entire complex was. I wonder what it even looked like. Um, like what was the demographic? What was what were, was it a tourist attraction back then? Was it just a a site in which people just went and and gathered and worshipped or was it just or is it all a hoax right again i don't know guys i i really don't know i know for sure that the older nazca lines are legit 100 percent um but just these photos are ridiculous okay so the researchers from the university led by professor masato sakai have been studying the nazca line since 2004 and while the latest discovery is a tremendous boon to their research, scientists say much more is needed to continue their work while preserving the site, obviously, right? They've been working at the site for 16 years. That's how long, even with drone technology, you would think, oh, you can just fly a drone up there for the length of the Nazca lines and, and the surrounding area and just take pictures and see. But this takes, this tick, this is a 16 year thing. They have to make sure, there's a lot of stuff that they have to, uh, examine and analyze and be careful not to you know step in certain areas so so i can see that um it may be tricky to continue working while preserving the site at the same time because archaeology for them unless you're dealing with lidar or something it it's pretty destructive you've got to dig in pretty deep and um, if they're doing any excavations around the area just to see if these um symbols demarked like burial or a sunken city or whatever it is treasure whatever it is they're gonna have to survey the spot pick the best spot justify that spot with funding to to higher ups and then start the excavation so it's a long period um but i don't even think they're doing excavations um or if they could get if they can get permission to do excavations so um Anyway, so these efforts led to the detection of new figures, which range from roughly 5 to 100 meters in length. Okay, much like the known uh, Nazca drawings, the geoglyphs discovered by Sakai seem to depict a wide range of living things and objects, including people, birds, monkeys, fish, reptiles, and abstract designs uh, made by the uh, ancient culture by removing rocky block topsoil, all uh, that stuff I mentioned. So they, they found this humanoid, and again, this is pretty visual, but this... It, it looks like a spider human. That's what it looks like. Or it could look like a person wearing a fanny pack or like a flap, like an apron or something uh, with a mask on, like a tiki mask with dreadlocks at the top or something. That's what it looks like. Um, and this thing's huge. It's like four meters, no, over four meters wide. It's like five or six meters wide um, and probably like 10 meters long or something like that. Probably longer than that, 12 meters long. Anyway, it's pretty big for for a geoglyph right um another one is a bird which i guess it could be it looks like a hummingbird i guess um flapping its wings it's very angular uh there are a lot of triangles isosceles triangles going on here um another humanoid that looks like a video game character have you guys played um that nintendo game pikmin i've never played it but i know i know the name Look up a Pikmin, and then this guy looks like one of those characters, but holding a stick. It, it's, I don't know. It's allegedly it's two meters wide, probably like 10 meters tall. Um, it's facing, I think, southwest. So I don't know. It's up to you guys what you guys think, but that looks just ridiculous to me. Um, this one is a snake, a double I guess it's a double-headed snake and eating two people. And it looks like the one on the right looks definitely like a serpent for sure. And there's like a mummy, a guy looks like, he looks like, it's like a silhouette of a guy who's wrapped kind of like a mummy who's about to get eaten. And then the one on the left looks like he's, the snake is biting the person from like the scruff of their, the, like the neck, like the collar, the back of their collar. And he's being dragged like, like a bully in high school would do to a nerd, right? Just uh, grabbing him by the scruff and about to like throw him out of the tavern or something. That's what it looks like. Um, but again, it, lo it looks very cartoonish. 
Very interesting stuff. And then there's one fish, which looks pretty interesting. Um, it kind of looks like an ink blot, but but definitely clearly some type of fish for sure, or like a Siamese fish or something. It looks, or kind of like a halibut, I guess. It kind of looks like that. Uh, there's one that might be a killer whale. I don't know where they got. It looks like more like a coyote to me, but I guess it could be a killer whale. But I don't know. I I feel like I'm I'm biased here. And then there's one. It looks like a human. It looks like ET carrying a boombox. That's what it looks like. Or ET with like a really curly tail that's going up and over his shoulder. Um, and then there's one that looks like a Stegosaurus. It looks. I don't know, guys. Um, there's one that looks like a tiki head. There's one that looks like a cat, like Felix the cat. I don't know. Some of these are ridiculous. Um, but anyway, let me know what you guys think about this one. The the 143 more huge uh, ancient drawings in Peru. Um, and, let, and let me know what you guys think about geoglyphs in general. Um, why were they even there? Were they, were they there to, to help tell a story? So this is what I've been thinking. Uh, I mentioned in the past, I think last week or, the, or two weeks ago, I talked about um, oral traditions, how, pe how people were able to maintain oral traditions across generations and still maintain the story. And we went into that and how there were designated people in the community and, and there were, there were uh, incentives for them to, to, to carry the story on and punishable by death if they told the wrong story. Um, all of these things, but maybe the geoglyphs helped, maybe it was like a presentation, right? Maybe they would gather at these rock art sites and they would meet up with, um, the shaman or, or, or the people who would tell these tor stories, maybe the elders most likely. And then they would use these as kind of visual aids with not writing, but just symbols they can refer to, um, as they told their story, right? That makes a lot of sense to me too. Because why else would they write them there? I mean, aside from scribbling art, but I feel like if they were sketching, they would probably just do it on the ground, like in the sand. But to go to the length of right, putting these on, on the wall and without them being scratched or erased or anything and covered with something else, um, it seems like they knew exactly what they were doing. They were deliberate and they, they were planning on the symbols to put there. It doesn't seem like they were haphazardly there. So I just think that, uh, what do you guys think? I think that they, they do help with, um, telling the story that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and some of these pictures are just amazing guys. If you just scroll through, um, th there are pictures of plant life, um, uh, d different, uh, there are people, obviously tools, uh, Ibex and other different types of animals, some extinct animals, um, horses, of course, really interesting stuff. Um, I highly recommend you guys check it out. And, um, as for what kind of story they're telling, I don't know. It could range. It could be origin stories. It could be stories of their ancestors. Maybe it's just, maybe they're for some of them are made for children, bringing them up in the culture and explaining to them their customs and why things are. Well, if you have kids, what's the number one, th especially toddlers, that, as soon as they start to talk, what's the number one thing that they ask? They ask why, why, why is it this way? Why is it that way? They want to know why. Maybe this is their way of addressing it. Maybe um, adolescents just wanted to know their place. Um, and this is how they did it. Maybe that's a big part of it too. Maybe there were secret societies. Maybe they were, uh, sh sharing esoteric knowledge. It could be that too. I mean, Lord knows there are secret societies now. Definitely there are. What are fraternities? They, they basically, if you trace fraternities, they come from this, I they're born from this idea of an esoteric class of people that share certain information with each other. They're a network, right? Networking isn't a new thing, guys. Networking has been happening since humans were able to communicate. What, whether written communication or oral communication, people develop networks, trust networks, right? That's what villages were. That's where early settlements were. That's where hunting bands were, right? Anyway, um, 
Wow, we are. It's already time for the next break. We're almost at the top of the first or the bottom of the the first hour, guys. So uh, we did go over the stuff on Iran. We went over the man, the square mantis man. We went over the the thing I'm on the fence about regarding the Nazca lines. At the next hour, actually, you know what? I'm gonna go another seven minutes. I'll go another seven minutes for you guys, and then from there, um, we will take a break and go visit uh, Bruce Hunton's stuff on the Santa Elena Rock Shelter. Um, so anyway, bitshoot.com slash the jindo, youtube.com slash the jindo, twitter.com slash the jindo. Leave a, send me a tweet, leave a comment, thumbs up, like, subscribe, please. Um, I am pleased with the growth of the channel. You guys are amazing. I love doing this. You guys are great for opening my eyes. I've learned just as much from you guys as, you've, as I've turned you guys on to different things. Um, I'm sure of it. So keep those comments coming. Keep those uh, articles coming. Um, there, I got a, a really good one recently. Um, that I would like to share with you guys at the bottom of the second hour before we close the show for the week. Great stuff uh, by commenter Eric. Eric is the man. He has quickly rose the ranks of commenters and has, you know, been delivering great stuff. David Peters is another guy. He hasn't commented in a while, but he sent me a bunch of great stuff, and I would like to go through his stuff as well. Stuff from way back if we have time. Um, and then, you know, everyone else, you know who you are. Uh, so let's talk about this ancient shell. Okay, I want to get to this. So if if you guys have been following, if it, especially if you've read the Bible and stuff, but um, if you guys have been following any of this channel or any of the work of other people, um, you would know... Right, especially if you know sacred geometry, it probably sounds familiar to you that the the t time was shorter, a year was shorter, a while ago, right in our past. Like right now, we have a, a year is three hundred and sixty five days, and plus some change, I think, um, and it's getting longer. What not with each passing year, but over time, I think it's getting longer, or at least that's what the trend is. That's what uh, scientists are saying. Um, so they find this ancient shell, right? It shows the days were half hour shorter 70 million years ago. So remember what I said about stuff being being discovered and then being consistent with ancient stories? Well, some there are a lot of ancient stories, and you can look it up. Um, I, I don't want to bring them up here now, but a year was 360 days, right? Exactly. Kind of like 360 degrees of a circle. Um, a day was, or a year was 360 days. So a lot was made of this. I think there have been <laughs> wars won and fought, uh, fought and won and lost over uh, changing the calendar, all of this stuff. Um, and for good reason. So back, I guess, when dinosaurs were allegedly walking the earth over 66 million years ago, the earth was rotating 372 times a year, right? Um, then the current 365. So back then, that means since it rotated faster, the day lasted only 23 and a half hours. So when you expand that out um, over a year, then that would get to about closer to 360 days a year, I think. Someone check the math on that. I'm not, I'm not doing the math. So basically, it was the day was 30 minutes shorter. Um, so they find this ancient shell from an extinct and wildly diverse group known as rudest clams. Okay, this type of clam is really old. They've been around forever. Um, they've survived a bunch of shit. And just by kind of like tree ring dating, where you look at the rings and you could just tell just by backtracking the rings uh, through time, you can see how long they were, they were alive. They're kind of like uh, biological bookmarks, so to speak. 
Well, these sh clams are very similar. So they, they grow fast, they lay down daily growth rings. And so the study entailed using lasers to sample these little slices of shell and they just counted the growth rings with microscopes, right? So they had, they, they were able to look deep into the rings at, because, you know, after about a hundred or so years, it's going to get hard to count the years. We're talking 70 million year old rings, guys. 70 million years. That's a long fucking time. So determine the number of days in a year and more accurately calculate the length of a day 70 million years ago. That's how they were able to, to check because they would just measure the time between or the, the distance between each ring. And they found that 30 minutes a, a, a day, it was faster. It was shorter rather compared to now so what does that mean does that mean we're petering out are we losing are we losing momentum around the around the sun is that what's going on is it a gravity thing is it does it have to do with the moon that i don't know all that stuff is up in the air but all they know what they think they know for sure is that days were shorter and that if that is true then, you know, these ancient customs and what the ancients were saying is also true. And what these, uh, I guess you can call them uh, sacred geometrists, geometricians, I guess you would call them. <laughs> um, and it does make sense, right? 360 days in a year, like a perfect circle. Um, and then the average lifespan being 72 years and one year happens to be... I don't know, one degree every 72, like the earth and procession moves one degree every 72 years. And it goes back to what I was talking about last week about the great year, the cosmic clock and all that stuff. You guys, if you guys missed that episode, you can go back and watch it on my channel. We got really deep into time and time scales and, and the great year being a part of, of the cog in a greater year and how the book of Ezekiel was uh, related to all that. So, um, he hasn't totally checked that out. Uh, so anyway, so this new measurement informs models of how the moon formed and how close to Earth it has been over 4.5 billion year history. Um, they also found corroborating evidence that the mollusks harbored photosynthetic symbi symbionts that may have fueled reef building on the scale of modern day corals. Uh, the high resolution ob obtained in the new study combined with the fast growth rate of the ancient bivalves revealed unprecedented detail about how the animal lived and the water conditions it grew in down to a fraction of a day. So they, this is how detailed it is. Um, granted, I do uh, would I would like to see and talk to one of the scientists who worked directly on the project just to pick their brain about it. Um, but it is pretty interesting when they say that four to five data points per day is something that they get. And in geological history, that is pretty, because geological time scales are really long. So if you get f five data points a day, that's huge, right? So he goes on to say, we can basically look at a day 70 million years ago. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and yeah, that is amazing if true, right? Um, but their, their studies have been published, so... There is some sort of consensus here, but I do think this is something worth bookmarking and checking in on later. Uh, studies like this one give a glimpse of change on the time scale of living things and have the potential to bridge the gap between climate and weather models. Chemical analysis of the shell indicates ocean temperatures were warmer in the late Cretaceous than previously appreciated. So again, the late Cretaceous was one of these periods of warming. Um, it was about 140 degrees in the summer and 86 degrees in the winter. So yeah, it's significantly warmer now. And then eventually the Cretaceous tertiary uh, thing happened and um, everybody got wiped out at the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's pretty interesting to see some of this climate data and some of this uh, biological data from these, uh, these shells. Um, so the, the fact that they were also building reefs was analyzed so what they did was they took a single individual that lived over nine years in a shallow seabed in the tropics, which right at 70 million years ago was, um, is, well, 70 million years ago, it was a, it was a shallow seabed. Now it's dry land in the mountains of Oman, which is, you know, n near, uh, the Red Sea. 
Uh, Mollusks look like tall pine glasses with lids shaped like bear claw pastries. <laughs> the ancient mollusks had two shells that met in a hinge, asymmetrical cl like asymmetrical clams. Grew in dense reefs like modern oysters. They thrived in water several degrees warmer worldwide than modern uh, oceans. So um, basically, they found that the composition of the shell changed more over the course of a day than over seasons or with the cycles of ocean tides. So again, um, they're able to fine scale this resolution, break it down to the daily layers. Again, four to five data points per day. Okay, so that's basically... You can tell what, what if you don't know what that means. That means that they can, they have five points of information that they can extract to make some sort of conclusion or some sort of analysis about what happened on that day. Okay, and in geology, that's unprecedented because in geology, everything is on large time scales. It, it's very low resolution for the most part, except for these data points interspersed between epochs and stuff like that. But um, yeah, this is really interesting to have even to know when the ocean, what the ocean tides were like 70 million years ago. That's uh, that's a big uh, that's actually huge if you're a researcher, because that's such so much information that you could you could bookmark and come back to later once another discovery is made. Um, you have the day night rhythm of the light being recorded in the shell as well, which, again, is amazing. Um so when uh, they, they counted the numbers of daily layers, they found 372 for each yearly interval. So again, 300, um, 372 days. The number of days within a year has been shortening over time because days have been growing longer. So again, um, this is one hypothesis. So the length of a day has been growing steadily longer as friction from ocean tides caused by the moon's gravity slows the Earth's rotation. So that's interesting. Um, one thing I have, though, one problem I have with this, though, is um, how wouldn't this affect the great year? W wouldn't the great year every time be slower if the Earth is, if the wobble on the Earth's axis as it's spinning is going slower? Wouldn't that extend the great year? And I'm not sure. I don't know how that works. Some people would even argue that the Earth isn't even rotating, right? The Earth is stationary and everything's rotating around the Earth. And some legit ancients thought that as well. Um, so I don't know how all this is reconciled, but it is interesting to see it in biology. Uh, and by it, I, I don't mean um, the Earth rotating, but the length of days. So something was going on for sure. Um the pull of the tides accelerates the moon a little in its orbit. So as this is all hypothesis. So as Earth spin slows, the moon moves farther away. The moon is pulling away from the Earth at 3.82 centimeters per year, one and a half inches a year. Hmm. Precise la la uh, laser measurements of distance to the moon from Earth have demonstrated this increasing distance since the Apollo program left helpful reflectors on the moon's surface. Um... Yeah, I guess so. Um, if I were to bring that up to somebody, though, I, I there are just so many, people, so many people I know who would dispute that there are even reflectors on the moon's surface. So, I don't know. Again, all this is um, conjecture, okay? Scientists conclude, in their hypothesis anyway, the moon could not have been receding at this rate throughout its history because projecting its progress linearly back in time would put the moon inside the Earth only 1.4 billion years ago. Yeah, so there, there's some there's some math they need to work out. There's some kinks they need to work out in this. Scientists know from other evidence that the moon has been with us much longer, most likely coalescing in the wake of a massive collision. Yeah, this is Tiamat. Um, if you guys don't know the story of Tiamat, go look it up. It's basically Earth 1, Earth 2. They crash into each other, right? Or Earth crashes into what is now the moon, and the moon was allegedly a part of something... Uh, uh, bigger right and so yeah anyway you guys should look up Tiamat in that entire uh, story uh, so the moon's rate of retreat has changed over time and information from the past like a year in the life of an ancient clam helps researchers reconstruct that history and model of the formation of the moon so again in the history of the moon 70 million years is a blink of time obviously uh, they want to apply this method to older fossils and catch the snapshots. Okay, so 
obviously the next move is to find more p possibly older fossils that'd be great if they can find one like 300 million years or so because that would be gr or even even closer to a billion the problem with discussing this though especially if you um are new to some of this is or even even just everybody across the board talking about this the the numbers are so huge million time scales of millions and billions of years um it just becomes so abstract that it's hard to really uh get a grasp on what this all means if true the gra the the quote unquote gravity of the situation um is hard it, it's it goes over people's heads including mine so um let me know what you guys think about that about finding about measuring uh the growth rings in these bivalves and and extrapolating time frames in the remote past i mean man 70 million plus years ago that's really that's really tough to um to w be able to 100 percent say this is how long a day was 23 and a half hours 70 million years ago it's because we checked this stuff out and we looked at it through a microscope and all this stuff um it's very interesting though i think it's worth keeping a bookmark on keep looking into it and uh see uh how the 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 journey right the scientific journey in that in that uh subject progresses so it'd be interesting to see and it could be it could be bullshit too so i wouldn't write it off though it seems pretty promising especially since um there are large uh changes in time uh reported by ancient stories and such so uh go figure Anyway, we are we are at the top of the hour now, the top of the second hour. I will take a break, and we will touch base and talk about the Santa Elena Rock Shelter, Central Brazil's oldest site of human habitation, confirmed. We will get into that. Go to youtube.com slash the Jindo. Twitter.com slash the Jindo. YouTube.com slash bitshoot.com slash the Jindo. Check all this stuff out. And I'll be back. Thank you for tuning in to the radio broadcast or broadcast today. Um, happy Vernal Equinox already if you're just tuning in. It's 2.06 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. How are you doing? Uh, Twitter.com slash agenda. Please, I am taking comments and tweets. Any questions? I'm taking them for the next hour. If you want to get a word in edgewise on any of the stuff that we're talking about, um, that I just the song I just played for all you guys that are interested in the music that I'm playing, that was, if you guys don't know that song, I don't know what to tell you. You're, you're probably not American. <laughs> sorry um that was nirvana it smells like teen spirit i'm sure every, that's, i think there's a billion views on youtube on it um the song's been overplayed forever um yeah so that song just came up the song after that was avenged sevenfold mia that was the beginning of that if you guys want to check that out you can they are from my hometown of huntington beach california Okay, so uh, as I promised you guys, we are going to talk about the Santa Elena Rock Shelter. This is uh, courtesy of Bruce Fenton's work. Um, I will tweet out the link to this article, but if you just type in Bruce Fenton, Santa Elena Rock Shelter, you should bring up this reading. And if you guys want to um, read along with me, that's fine. But I will talk about... I just want to explain some stuff broadly and fill in some of the details as we go. And please, I encourage all you guys to ask, send send Bruce a tweet. He's He's been on, well, obviously the tour has been on hold, but he was on tour talking about all this stuff and more. Um, this is some uh, really interesting, I was going to do an episode on this, but I think it's just better in the radio format. There are some photos um, but I'll just let you guys know what the, what they are and what to look up, and then you guys can just look uh, with me and follow along again. So the article is, Humans present, 
at Brazil's Santa Helena Rock Shelter 23,120 years ago confirms National Museum of Natural History in Paris. So this is from September 7th, 2017. So they dated these bone ornaments, okay? And these bone or ornaments were made from the bones of a, an, ex an extinct animal, which we'll get into a little bit later. And um, these details of the new dating were already published in a paper for Cambridge University's Archaeology Journal, Antiquity. So this is published on August 8th, 2017. So this is all out there, guys. This isn't some hoodoo nonsense. This is all already in the mainstream. It's already published. It's already accepted, okay? These are already in there. Um, and again, in this journal, they did confirm that modern humans were at Brazil's rock shelter significantly earlier than 20,000 years ago. So the 23,000 year, uh, 120 year date is the, it's the most conservative date that they have with everything that they've analyzed. They're, they're actually, um, the oldest dates that they proposed that are again, met with a lot of trepidation, a lot of hesitance and, but, and rightfully so they just want to make sure they, they, they're accurate. It's about 60,000 years. So we're, that's the that's the older end of this of this gap between sixty thousand and but twenty three thousand one hundred twenty years is the the as old as they're gonna go for sure the conservative estimate but is probably far older. So um, if you guys don't know about the Santa Elena Rock Shelter, it's in central Brazil, home to extraordinary rock art, and we just talked about uh, in the last hour petroglyphs and geoglyphs and how important they are. Um, and evidence of lengthy occupation by the first, the quote, first Americans. Okay. Um, again, this is pre Clovis, right? Um, I did an episode on Idaho, the snake river, uh, the snake river Valley. Uh, and it, it, again, it, it's push all, there are people living here 20,000 years ago already all over South and North America. They weren't in the middle of transitioning. They weren't. They weren't hiking. They were in the middle of, of their migration. They were already settled, guys. Okay? These proto-Americans, these pre-Clovis people. All right? Just getting out. And they were growing stuff like corn and genetically modifying stuff like corn. That's insane. Okay? Anyway. Moving on. And they're doing ayahuasca and that type of stuff, too. Anyway, moving on. Occupation of the site is dated to several different periods, suggesting that groups of hunter-gatherers only dwelt at the site when climate favored hunting in the region. So it was intermittently occupied during the hunting season and only when the climate allowed. Remember, this is a remote shelter, guys. It's very far away from the coast. It's in the thick of the jungle, okay, of central Brazil. And so remember, and why is that important? Because the coast was mainly where the people were living, okay? The, the people who were going to the jungle, although there are people living in the jungle, no doubt about it, there are indigenous tribes, there are hunter-gatherers who, who live that type of life. But as far as rock shelter goes, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you're not going to stay in one spot. You're going to go where the climate allows you to. So, to. so for the longest time, it was an inter... The, the archaeologists knew that it was an intermittently... Uh, occupied site and they know that from excavation so then you dig a certain length right let's say you dig 12 feet that layer okay they'll separate out by layers they'll find human evidence in different layers so maybe layer 12 has oh, okay here's some human occupation and then maybe a few layers above that there's no human there's no human artifacts and then they find something later right and then same thing a few layers, a few thousand years where not, there's nothing found, and then they'll find something, right? That's why they they think it was intermittently occupied, okay? Just wanted to get out there. Um, so again, the irregular periods of occupation spread across the late Pleistocene and late Holocene. So again, late Pleistocene is around 20, like 20,000 years ago, right? The late Pleistocene, if you guys don't know, we live in the Holocene now. Okay, the Holocene started 12,000 years ago or so, 13,000 years, years ago or so, when the climate shifted, arguably brought on by the Younger Dryas period, um, and the Pleistocene was the epoch before that. Okay, um, so archaeologists have always been investigating these occupation sites across Brazil, 
Um, they've produced evidence of extremely early colonization of this part of America. Again, they're the oldest dates that they've pushed is 60,000 years ago, but is very controversial, met with a lot of resistance. They need more evidence, which is fine, but it's out there. Six, that, that date 60,000 years ago was published, okay? Um, but again, they, they, put, they make sure that people know that those are tentative numbers, that they're still... They, it still merits ongoing investigation. Excavations carried out at the Santa Elena Rock Shelter between 1984 and 2004, okay, so a period of 20 years, explored three sediment layers containing the remains of hearths, stone artifacts, and bones associated with the extinct giant sloth species, Glossotherium. So this giant sloth, they were hunting and killing, and they found that they were, there was like bony plate armor, pretty much, or ornament, ornaments, whatever they were, this sloth skin was converted into these types of ornaments by the resident humans. So they were wearing it for whatever reason, right? That's indicative of a lot of things, right? Abstract thought, traditions, religion, uh, the aspect of, you know, all of these things, maybe even war, but they don't, they don't know for sure. Why would they wear that? There's probably some sort of shaman was wearing it. Um, the, the added notches and holes may have been allowed may have allowed these plates to be worn on the body so they were they were hunting the giant sloths and using their bones for stuff and this is the date this is where they get the hard date of 23,120 years um so <clears throat> this species again the giant sloths became extinct around 12,000 years ago along with many other megafauna of the americas south america and north america got hit pretty hard when it came to uh these large-scale extinction of megafauna, including the woolly mammoth, saber-toothed tiger, um, this giant ground sloth we just talked about, uh, all of these things, giant beaver, right? Uh, scientists utilized three separate dating methods to investigate samples of charcoal, sediment, and the sloth bones. So the dates, again, 23,120 years. Um, and then later groups you'd use the rock shelter 10,120 years ago and then 2,000 years ago. So again, um, the intermittently uh, being occupied. And again, it was only occupied when the climate allowed it. So again, you, the climate data is useful here as well. Usually if, if a place is warm, there are probably people there at some point. And that's climate data is how archaeologists narrow down part of the it goes into their thought process and their decision making process as to which where to ex excavate essentially um so this add this to a list of a study series of archaeological findings having caused a growing number of archaeologists to abandon clovis first okay so if you guys um if you guys just look up santa Elena, you should get you should get this map of south america and there's this place, Mato Grosso, which is Santa Elena. There's a Toca de Cerote site. There's Gar Garancio site in Bahia, Brazil. There's four other sites again. So there's a ton of sites now that or uh, that have evidence of um, of other uh, of basically megafaunal and human interaction across Brazil. And again, megafauna went extinct 12,000 years ago. So if any, all of these interactions had to have been during the Pleistocene, during the Ice Age, okay? That's huge. Not very many megafauna survive in North and South America. A lot of, there's a mass extinction. So again, these interactions are very important to document and know. Um, the rock shelter is over 12,000 kilometers from the proposed entry site of the Clovis first model. Not only is Santa Elena far from the earliest Clovis sites, but it's also over 2000 kilometers from the coast in a heavily forested region. I just mentioned this. So why are there people here before this proposed, uh, Clovis, uh, people came in? So that's something that needs that merits investigation. Uh, the American continent was colonized as is logical to suspect that humans lived along the coastline long before making the arduous journey into Brazilian interior 23,120 years ago. So again, the, a lot of explaining, right? So one, one possibility is the first settlers used canoes to colonize the Americas 
and drifted down the Pacific coast in a simple watercraft before heading inland. I talked about this with the Columbia River. If you, if that, if you were coming down from Antarctica and the west coast of Canada along the Pacific and you wanted to go inland, one of the first turns off that Pacific coast highway, so to speak, is the Columbia River, right? So again, there are many instances of this and that is definitely a possibility. Um, the first colonization must have involved a movement of people from another continent, essentially, either Africa, Australia, right? Siberia. If you watch the Idaho episode, the Snake uh, River Valley, then Japan, Hokkaido, some people, because there were identical tools found in Idaho and Japan, which is amazing, right? So, um, again, uh, the, this, this article is cited, too, with sources from Antiquity, the Quaternary, International, Earth Science Review, Science Daily, Science News, all of these uh, sites. So definitely look this up. Um, get, uh, look up Santa Elena. This is a huge uh, point. It's like an information da data point. And there are many of these sites now in, in Brazil, Amazonia, Peru, Chile. So more and more sites are coming up. The only thing missing, really, are more of these Younger Dryas impact sites. So I know Pilauco is a very uh, common site. There's another one in Venezuela, I think, or somewhere in northern South America. Um, there are probably more. I mean, if there's one in Pilauco, whew, man, that's pretty far down south. So um, who knows how many... Uh, uh, fragments hit the earth, but it's definitely got to be more than 40, which is the number of confirmed impact sites. Um, so yeah, anyway, hit me with a comment, guys. If you have a comment for me regarding um, the Younger Dryas Boundary, the Santa Elena Rock Shelter, the peopling of South America, all of this stuff, I would gladly, gladly entertain your comments here. Um, so... Uh, I think we're going to take a, a quick break again. YouTube.com slash the Jindo. Twitter.com slash the Jindo. Bitshoot.com slash the Jindo. Check those out. And um, we will be back after this break. All right, everybody. We are back close to the bottom of the second hour here. How are you doing? I am Justin of the Jindo, youtube.com slash the Jindo, bitchu.com slash the Jindo, twitter.com slash the Jindo. Please follow, like, subscribe. Leave feedback. Leave a comment, please. Uh, we're going to do this one last segment in which we're going to talk about this uh, Ice Age mammoth structure found in Russia made of mammoth bones, which is super interesting. Oh, before I forget, that music you just heard, if you don't know, that was Trust Company Downfall, that first song. That second, the beginning of that second song was, I think it was a band called Hooba Stink. Crawling in the Dark by Hooba Stink, yes. I think that was like 2003 or something. Um... Anyway, so let's talk about this CNN article, which came out three days ago. Mysterious Ice Age structure made from hundreds of mammoth bones discovered in Russia. So around 25,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers used the bones from 60 mammoths to build a large circular structure in Russia, and they don't know why, not yet anyway. Uh, they have excavated the site in an attempt to understand it, but they don't know why the structure was built, according to a new study. Obviously, um, this isn't the first mammoth house to be found in Russia, but it's the oldest and largest, measuring 41 feet across. So there are a few of these sites are across Russia. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, they found these. Um, I think they called it Kostenki 11. That's the name of the site. Um, 300 miles south of Moscow. And they, since then, they've made a, a archaeological museum there. Um, 
who knows what these mammoth houses were used for, but it definitely must have been a very important part of their their culture. Again, um, just one quick thing about hunting mastodons and mammoths and stuff like that. Um, so I don't question whether or not they were capable of doing that. 100% people were capable of doing They even They even had uh, special uh, spear points to deal with larger animals. But I don't believe for one second that they overhunted them. We can't even overhunt pigs with, with machine guns. So it doesn't make any sense that these people were to do it. It, it took a, lo- a team. It took teams of people, coordination, tools to do this. Okay. But they were doing it for sure. And they were bu- building houses. So, And chances are people who are hunting animals, they probably had mad respect for them. So I don't think they were just uh, flippantly hunting these, these animals. And by the way, there, there wasn't a mass extinction of, of mammoths uh, concurrent with the Clovis people in this region. So go figure for that. Uh, 2014, researchers found evidence of this structure at the site and began excavation in 2015, which took three years. So the study was detailed in the journal Antiquity. Um, again, I just in the last out in the last segment I mentioned Antiquity as well uh, for the Santa Elena Rock Shelter site. Twenty three thousand one hundred twenty years ago, people were living there as well. So these mammoth bone structures dating to the Ice Age have been found across Eastern Europe. Uh, the oldest ones found were dated to twenty two thousand years ago. Until this one pushes back the site, pushes back the dates rather. So. Um, if they were doing this 40,000 years, that, that means it's a period of 20,000 years between the oldest one that they found and then, and then this one. So how many generations of people are that, or is that rather, that were carrying on the tradition of mammoth house building? So th- that's very interesting to me. And um, it really does put the petroglyph stuff into perspective. So uh, in terms of uh, that petroglyphs being in symbol and rock art and all that stuff being oral, um, basically tools to help pass oral traditions, essentially. Uh, Based on previous discoveries, researchers believe they were constructed by Paleolithic people to serve as houses, providing refuge during harsh winters. Ice Age winters likely had lows reaching negative four degrees Fahrenheit. So, yeah, that sure, that makes sense. Um, Why would they build a structure if they weren't going to sleep in it? Um, but the fact that it was made out of, uh, mammoth bones is pretty eerie. There must be some sort of significance there because you could build stuff with other things and I'm sure they knew that. So, um, that, that again is, is a very peculiar thing. Um, it's surprising considering that populations of hunter gatherers never spent much time in one location. So why would hunter gatherers even think of staying in the winter? Why wouldn't they just move somewhere warmer, right? So there's there's more to this story than meets the eye, for sure. Alexander Pryor, the lead author and uh, archaeologist, he says, Mammoth bones are very heavy, and building the circular structure represents a huge investment of time and energy by the humans that built this. And if usually, for for ancient humans like this, Investing time and energy into something like a large scale project really does require that all the other basic basic needs are checked off, meaning food, water, shelter, right? If they were even if they needed shelter, maybe it was a makeshift shelter or something. But this one seems like it was more of a permanent thing, like it was something they set up so other people could use uh, for whatever reason. They're still not sure yet. So the bones formed, and you guys can look up the, the, the photo here, the excavation site. Again, this is radio. I can't share a screen with you, or yeah, I can't share my screen with you. But if you just Google Mammoth uh, House Bones Russia, it should come up. It should, it, this is from CNN. There's probably a bunch of other articles as well. The bones formed a continuous circle, no obvious entrance, according to the study. So far, the researchers have identified 51 mammoth mandibles and 64 skulls. So that that's a lot of that's a lot of bones, guys. 64 skulls. Uh, that's a lot. That that doesn't it, you can't gather all that stuff in a day. That's probably months and months and months of of just uh, probably seasons and seasons worth of mammoth. Just imagine if you just hunting down and killing one adult fully formed mammoth. That could feed 
a village for a while, guys. It's not like the chicken. It's not like the GMO cho- chicken you can get, right? It's actually that's a lot of meat. That's a lot of biomass to go through. And so, sixty-four of those. Um, wow, that's a lot of capability. That implies a lot of things. Maybe a huge population. Maybe just not good, sophisticated technology that uh, made it easy to hunt them. But uh, yeah, who knows? This merits a lot of investigation if this is legit. Okay. The wealth of bones used to construct the site are visible during excavation, obviously. Um, inside the circle, the researchers also found the first evidence that wood was burned inside it. That's interesting. So again, they could have used that for either ceremonial purposes, which I have to think because why would you have a fire pit in a house made of bones, like mammoth bones, unless it was for some sort of either funerary or some sort of custom? And that's a really interesting custom. Um, I don't think they were just doing it to sleep unless mammoth bone is like an amazing insulator or something like that because they're thick. Um, no signs of long-term habitation inside the structure. So yeah, again, it could either be a seasonal thing or just like a event, right? Maybe some sort of custom again, maybe some sort of, maybe they weren't sacrificing, but you know, some sort of social gathering at the very least. Uh, researchers believe that it didn't act as a wintertime uh, refuge, which has them rethinking the purpose of these massive time consuming structures. Yeah. I don't think it was just, it was just that because if it was a wintertime refuge, they would have made something like an igloo, something more impermanent than these fucking bones of 64 mammoths. Jesus. That is, if you guys, um, I had a, I had a dog die recently a few weeks ago. Uh, rest in peace, Goliath. Uh, take a shot if you're drinking. <laughs> I would if I if I had something here. Um, and it just there's a weird feeling, right? Not just the fact that he was my dog, but just the fact of, of it's a body, right? It's a former host of of whatever you want to call it, a spirit, a, a, a unit of consciousness. Having 64 mammoth skulls, and then you're lighting a fire, a bonfire inside with a bunch of other people for whatever reason, there must have been some sort of energy that was palpable. That That's just for what I think. Obviously, you can't prove that with science or there's no hard data supporting that. But I, it, just, it just seems to me to be a very obvious thing to do, even if you're a, pr- a so-called primitive human. They must have noticed that there was some sort of vibe being like they're either they're trying to indulge in. There was something that they were trying to tap into by doing this. Uh, so this is what Pryor says. It clearly meant something to them, and there was very likely a ritual element to it, even if the structure ultimately had some sort of practical purpose too. Obviously, you don't want to be cold and freeze your ass off when you're trying to conduct a ritual. That's for certain. Um, so the first mammoth, uh, mammoth house found in more than 40 years at Kostanki. Um, they used some new techniques, obviously, to come to those dates. So one of these included flotation, so uh, archaeologists used flotation to separate material from soil using water and sieves. This allowed for the discovery of tiny fragments, which can provide the minute details of a larger story. So, yeah, I've heard of this being used before. It's j- exactly as they say. You, they just uh, flood it with water and then just collect everything that, fo- that floats up. Um, so they, by doing this, they found a possible su- food source for these people. Besides the mammoths, obviously, they found uh, soft plant tissue of edible roots and tubers. Um, so, again, these people were also, uh, not only were they hunting megafauna, they were eating um, plant plants, and that was a large part of their diet. Um, it illustrates how our human ancestors adapted to survive in harsh environments, right? Um, and, of course, if they're on the fringes of, of warm climate, then... then um, yeah, they, they must have been eating plants for sure. Uh, other things that the flotation technique revealed were tiny bits of charred wood. So that's how they knew that they were burning fires, wood fires. Um, and they were using wood as a resource um, just in general. Uh, other when, when compared to other areas in Northern Europe um, that showed signs of abandonment at the time, uh, the, what they found was that the trees were rare and a precious resource. That's an interesting note as well. Um, 
So again, this might be why they went to the site in the first place because it was basically where the tundra was. Certain trees grow there um, in the landscape. Despite the harsh conditions, there were trees there. So that might have been, um, maybe that might be the reason why they didn't want to cut down the trees and make them for shelter. Maybe they just saw that as a waste. Instead, they just wanted to use uh, mammoth bones. That could be an explanation as well. Uh, but again, that, <laughs> what's harder, cutting down a tree or killing a mammoth? I guess to them, killing a mammoth was worth the, the, the work rather than cut down a tree. So the, again, there's a lot of uh, stuff to be gleaned from this, a lot of uh, conclusions, not conclusions, but a lot of valid uh, data points to take make note of. Um, the discovery also inspires more questions for the researchers because they believed hunter-gatherers built these structures out of mammoth bones because wood was unavailable, but now that's bullshit. There was, uh, they chose mammoth bones deliberately. Um, they ha so they have to revise what they thought of originally. So um, it's not yet clear though, whether the bones are from mammoths recently hunted and killed or if they were scavenged from carcasses. So again, that's a big, that's a big uh, assumption to say that they were all killed. Maybe they just found them. But I think if, I think uh, animal animal marks on the bones would reveal would answer that question rather easily. So I don't know why they they still don't know. Um, another thing is Kostenki Eleven also seems too large to be a dwelling. It is difficult to imagine how an area this large could be roofed over using materials available in this environment. So um, maybe with food storage, but I don't know. Uh, why would they light a fire in there if it was ju just for food storage? Um, again, anyway, let me know what you guys think about that. Leave a comment, uh, tweet, tweet at me about the Kostenki site and um, these mammoth houses. Uh, okay, so it's 2.40. Wow. We will take one more break, and then I will get to listener comments and questions. Listener comments and questions from the past week, and then we will uh, end at the top of the hour. So please let me know. What you guys think? Twitter.com slash Jindo, YouTube.com slash Jindo, Bitshoot.com slash Jindo, and I will be back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show, the final segment of the week, guys. Until next week, I will try to have another uh, episode out this weekend, as per the usual. Probably tomorrow, for sure tomorrow. Maybe even tonight, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and then Sunday for sure. And yeah, well, uh, there's some stuff I've got, like I mentioned earlier in the show. There's a lot. There's a backlog of stuff. As far as music goes, I forget the first song that I played. Um, I think that was just like a remix of Canon and D. That second one, though, if you guys know, that was from 2007. That was Malcolm Kelly in the locker room of uh i think it was uh texas versus nebraska or something like that um yeah, i think they just won the the sugar bowl or something like that and he made that like little freestyle and someone put it over music i, was, I thought it was pretty <laughs> pretty interesting i thought it was actually pretty cool um back when freestyle rap was actually freestyle rap uh anyway um let's get to listener comments yeah there's there's a few that i want to get into uh let's see let's just go let's just go through the list um so mario mario simone I, I i mentioned him last time um he put he's great he puts a lot of uh uh, uh articles and translates them from italian into english he just posted an another one um this one's about uh sardinia it's, it's too long to read all of it but you guys should definitely go check it out um, it's basically going into uh, uh, Plato and the Great Sea and uh, the Phoenician Punic and Greek uh, colonies of the of the Mediterranean and all that stuff, and it's it's a comment of the last uh, live uh, uh, it's like two videos ago from the last live uh, broadcast from la from the March thirteenth. You guys should totally check that out. Um. Let's see. Next one, Rowan O'Neill, another regular. Holy crap! I forgot about the Timor Islands. I was looking in, 
into the Southeast Asia for connections, but forgot about Timor. There's a place called Mount Yango in New Australia or North Southwest Australia. Is that is that NSW Australia, which is told to be the landing place of the Bayami, the one-legged god. Uh, tribes from as far as Darwin come to follow their old tales of where Bayami lived. But this gives the idea that the south end of Australia was the beginning, quotation, northeast of Sydney, was the beginning point. Some of that bushland is the same as uh, Gondwana Forest. We're talking, we're talking rather, 300 million year old trees, the same as the day dinosaurs were eating them. How did the East Coast survive without total destruction over 300 million years? That's very interesting. I haven't heard that. But yeah, the, the, um, that one legged god, god, though, those stories are very interesting. And there are tribes um, from all around Australia going to, um, to where they thought that one legged god uh, lived. And I would love to do a deep dive on that just to analyze what, what is. Um, the, what's the story with the one-legged god? I, I would love to deep dive further into that. It's very, very interesting stuff. Um, Eric Williams, waiting for the day another species of human is unearthed in America. What a long time for no other primate to find its way here. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, all these ancient species like Australopithecus and stuff, all of them are found like in, in Africa. Um, yet there are stories of primates in North America, specifically the American Northwest. Bigfoot's o the obvious one, right? What about the red-haired giants in, in the caves of, um, in, in Red Rocks, right? In, in modern-day uh, Nevada. There, are, there, are all, there were stories and stories of primates in North America as well. But it is interesting we haven't found them. Um, maybe the jury's still out. Maybe they have been found and it's suppressed, but for sure those red giant schools are locked in the back of some sort of museum that I, I am sure of because I've been told that and I've seen pictures of it um, by people in the know, essentially. Uh, origin explorers, I'm not surprised that their brains were bigger. Just imagine having to survive back then with just 10 sausages for hands. I thought that was funny. Um, this is from my last video, the Homo erectus, new fossils and new tools imply greater capacity for innovation than before. And I was talking about brain size, and I guess I'll elaborate on that here. Um, Neanderthals had bigger brain capacity than us. Um, Homo erectus found in Java had bigger uh, brains than, than the, the, quote, common Homo erectus that they found elsewhere. So, and the, the it does brain size indicate greater capacity and and in intelligence some people believe so some people think the jury's still out but if we just assume that the and origin explorers thank you for the comment um what he's getting at is he's talking about brains were bigger and and it being implying that it's necessary back then to have survived and part of that was the prerequisite for survival if you're a human was to have a big brain um, at least that's the hypothesis, right? And I think there is something to, to that. Um, greater capacity means greater survival instincts, right? Greater intelligence means you can cooperate better. You can come up with abstract, more complex plans to, you know, do stuff like hunting, agriculture, watching the cosmos, all that stuff, preserving, um, you know, worshiping, all that stuff, right? And this leads me to believe that if if they were more intelligent than us and had a greater capacity, like mental capacity than us, and they were still into religion and looking at the stars, they were obsessed with that, then maybe we should take a cue from that and really look into what they were looking into um, instead of getting all caught up in our own uh, bullshit, right? Especially in times like today, which I won't go into further. I don't want to talk about any of that political stuff. But but yeah, um, not to say maybe there was politics back then. Who knows? Um, maybe they were fighting with each other or whatever, but it's pretty obvious to say that they were, they were advanced in a different way. They were just focusing their time and energy on, on what appears to be the cosmos and, um, and, and hunting and gathering and, and, and serve and creating settlements and stuff like that. So, uh, moving on God's grace. It was part of Mu. This is in response to. Uh, ancient society in Easter Island uh, video from way back from over a year ago um, he says God's grace anyway says it was part of Mu as the Azores were part of Atlantis 
A uh, Russian team found white roads leading out from the island underwater. Um, yeah, uh, Easter Island is, for a long time, they, they found quarries underneath, so it doesn't surprise me that there were probably roads and and um, other settlements because Easter Island was, if you drain the water, it was the top of mountains, right? Um, and you have, to, you have to wonder why people would would go to Easter Island if it wasn't. So it, mu it probably was, along with the other chain, uh, chain of islands near Easter Island, it was probably, that, that entire complex was probably at one point inhabited. Um, another uh, site that's very similar is Yanaguni with these underground roads and, and these, uh, these huge blocks that are underneath um, the water. If you got, look up Yanaguni, Y-O-N-A-G-U-N-I, to see what I'm talking about, and you'll get you'll get these uh, pic these crazy pictures of uh, of these again roads. The Bimini Road is another one, right? The, the submerged road. So again, that's not unheard of. And God's grace, thank you for the comment. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Pavel Datsyuk, Dot, the very uh, the famous hockey player uh, from Detroit, the Detroit Red Wings. He says, I thought they found a black mat, uh, mat in South Africa, but I am not 100%, but I thought they found one somewhere in Africa. Um, I have not heard this, but I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised at this point, right? Especially in Northwest Africa, like uh, near the Canary Islands and or like around that area. Um, that would be very interesting to see if they found anything there. It seems like, though, that was more of a safe haven for people. People, it seemed like people poured into that area. Um, so maybe, maybe there w isn't an impact site there, but maybe in the surrounding area for sure. Um, yeah, uh, that's about it, guys, for today. Uh, for the comments, please leave me more comments if you want. Um, uh, you can tweet them out. To either at the Jindo or at uh, Justin JG underscore, and I guess I'll just play you guys out with some music. Uh, you get, stay tuned for uh, this weekend. Uh, this weekend I'll probably have one or two episodes out. Uh, there's just so much material to go through. Um, some of the stuff that I went over today was uh, stuff that I wanted to get to earlier this week, but I just couldn't. Um, happy Vernal Equinox again. You guys should definitely look up. I brought this up uh, plenty of times this this uh, broadcast, but um, if you look at this the sunrise at, on the vernal, if you look due east and the sunrise on the vernal equinox, you will see the sun rise in the constellation in which we are quote in right. So it would be between Pisces and Aquarius. Um, I, people think we're in the age of Aquarius now, but we're not. Okay, that's not. That's all new age shit. If here's how to tell where we are and what age we're in. Just do what I said. See where the sun rises in the morning. You can do it tomorrow too. Um, but yeah, if you guys type in spring equinox sunrise and type in anchor watt, you'll see these great images of of the sun directly aligned with these structures. Same thing with the uh, the Sphinx at Giza. Uh, same thing with the uh, um, at Serpent Mound. Um, actually, I think Serpent Mountain, Ohio. I think that's uh, I think that's summer solstice. Actually, on the summer solstice, I think is when um, uh, you'll see the alignment of the sun and uh, the serpent. Uh, but yeah, but as for the the vernal equinox, check out the Anchor Watt one. That one's really interesting. The Giza one's also very interesting as well. And um, yeah, that's about it. Just leave a comment, like, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, also, uh, you guys should follow the Grimerica guys too. They, they, this is the Grimerica FM, so I'm using their their airwaves for two hours a week. So you guys should definitely uh, follow them and uh, donate to them as well. Oh, I keep I always mention this. If you guys, I get a lot of questions about this. I don't really make it obvious how to donate to this to the, the this channel. But if you go to Bitshoot. Uh, under each video just go to any of my videos on the bottom there's a dollar sign you guys can just send some st uh something over uh either coin payments or uh paypal right that's pretty much if you guys want you guys don't have to obviously this is just all con free content that's just out there but if you want if you if you insist you can send me a few bucks okay so anyway um 
I would like to see more comments from you guys on Twitter. You guys should totally tweet tweet me out um, because it's just easier to send articles and links on Twitter. It's, there's a nice preview. I, I I think it's just the ease of access is much better. But but also leave a comment on, on YouTube as well if you want. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll uh, touch base probably tomorrow on some of the stuff I want to get to. And I'll see you guys next week on the next week's broadcast.